Hello everyone, this is Jabra Ghanem again with more from Genesis uh, chapters 12 to 17. And in this segment I will talk about chapters 12, 13, and 14. <clears throat> if you remember, this is the part that the Jews call Lech Lecha in Genesis, which means let's go because it starts with chapter 12's God telling Abraham or Abram at that point, the elevated father, Abram, elevated father, telling him to just get up and go and leave leave or leave leave Haran and go to the place that I will show you. So at this point you remember Lot Terah, uh, Abraham's father, leaves with Lot who is his uh, who's Abraham's nephew and his wife and uh, Sarai Sarai means princess who is also we learn in Genesis 20 is Abraham's half sister they share a father but not a mother this is important in, in what's what I'm going to talk about next and then they they just leave they get up and go there is famine there is there are wars we learn from some historical accounts uh, from historians that this is also a period of wars and uh, instability in that in that area so they they go and they go to uh, Canaan and they go to this place uh, called uh, the Plains of Mora. Now, this it's the Plains of Mora is kind of an interesting place because there isn't in Hebrew it says Elom More, and Elom can mean a plain or can mean a tree, and uh, More means teacher. It's it's a very very old word and it means teacher usually, but it's it's the name, and there is the you know the stories about it it's the name of a tree and the reason that's important is because trees in canaan were used by followers of some religions as for divination so it is it is an interesting choice for uh, for abraham abraham to be there now also the thing that happens in chapter 12 in the beginning is Abraham or Abram at this point is getting a blessing from the Lord that he's going to make a great nation out of him that he is going to bless his name that he will be a blessing in the ancient near east there is there was at the time this tradition of a tribe or a family or a certain people taking on a god like making a god theirs so my the god of my family is baal for example so in in this case there is indication that abram has taken uh, el has taken jehovah as his god has taken this god as his god and he's giving him all of these blessings it's uh, it's also a very interesting part of the story so he goes there and he's shown the lord shows abraham the country uh, he he has a, he has a theophany of sorts he sees it says uh, it says in verse 7 that god appeared to him and then he's just moving in the country and then there is another famine and so this is the interesting part of the story now this famine forces abram to go to egypt egypt has always been a lush fertile place and so before they go into egypt abram tells sarai his wife the princess his half sister tell the egyptians that you are my sister now abraham isn't lying here now we might think that abraham is doing a trick or wants to lie to the egyptians there there uh, there were some discoveries uh, of hurrian tablets uh, you know in the 50s i believe or, or mid 50s or early 60s where 
it revealed that there was a Hurrian. Remember, Abram comes from Haran, so the Hurrians are the people who lived in Haran. And there is a tradition where someone marries a woman and he gives her a special status. So two documents get signed, one document for marriage and another document where the man adopts the wife and makes her his sister. And that gives her this extra special status. So Abraham isn't lying because she's first his half-sister, as we'll learn in Genesis 20, in a similar encounter with Abimelech. Uh, but he's, he's telling the truth. And he's saying it so that, you know, for, for protection, because the Egyptians were apparently, according to the story, known for taking good-looking women. Now, here is the other thing that's interesting, interesting about the story. And that is, Sarah is a woman who is advanced in age. She's in her mid-70s. Now, I'm not saying women in their mid-70s cannot be beautiful. I mean, beauty has beauty is an inner and outer beauty. There is all kinds of standards of beauty. And the scriptures here uses the word, in Hebrew, they use the word yafe, uh, which in Arabic translates into sort of a close word, which is behe. And... Uh, that is a very general word. It, it can mean that you are someone who's impressive looking or someone who has like some feature that is appreciated. It's a striking looks of some sort. And there is lots of literature by Hebrew scholars, by Orthodox uh, scholars uh, who say, Sarah, Sarah was a beautiful woman, even gorgeous woman, even her old age physically. So who knows? But that is uh, that is the story. And so when she, they go into Egypt, Abram's thoughts uh, were right. The Egyptians look at her, and she they see that she is exceedingly fair, or in Hebrew they say meodiafe, which means she is very very fair very beautiful and uh, they take her in just as abram uh, predicted he tells he tells them they are my sister they take her in but then the house of pharaoh gets plagued and they realize she is his his wife and pharaoh calls him in and can't wait to get rid of uh, get rid of abraham and sarah uh, in a hurry. So he sends special people with them, gives them a whole bunch of wealth in terms of cattle, and he says, go away. So lech lecha, get, get out of here again. Then in chapter 13, they leave Egypt and they, uh, they go to Beth El, the house of God. Beth means house, El is the word for God. And uh, and they camp there and they make an altar and they call on God. And that's where Lot uh, comes in. Lot is, uh, is, a name, is also an interesting name like all biblical names. It comes from an uh, older root which is Malat. And Malat means someone who escapes or who is delivered from a predicament of sorts. And actually in some Arabic dialects uh, today, like Levant dialects, they use Malata, which means to escape, you know, escape by the skin of his teeth, sort of, as we say in idiomatic English, idiomatic American English. And so we have this man, Lot, and he also has uh, wealth that he is getting through his association with Abraham, which is very important to note here. So Lot's wealth is associated, it comes from his association with Abraham. And Abram at this point, or Abraham, is, is, is a very generous man because there is this disagreement that happens between their shepherds. And Abraham says, Lot, here is the land. Look at it, right and left. Choose what you choose what you want, and uh, of course, Lot looks around and he chooses the most fertile land, part of the land, which is in the area of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he pitches his tent towards Gomorrah. 
Now, the pitch, the direction of the pitching of the tent, usually uh, in tribal in tribal Arab cultures, you pitch your tent towards your to so that you can have a sort of a view of your wealth. So you pitch it towards the part where you can see your cattle, you can see your wealth, you can see your business affairs, you can monitor them, and that's what where lot uh, the direction Lot chooses to pitch his tent at, which tells us something about Lot and his inclinations. And this, I want you to remember this for when we to talk about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the part that Lot play uh, or the role of Lot and the whole thing. So. Abram, on the other hand, uh, goes to Canaan. Now he's focused on the covenant because remember, the Lord in the beginning told him to go to Canaan. He told him Canaan is, is his. And so Abram is focused on, on Canaan and that's, that's, where he, that's where he goes. And so he camps in that land. He again, uh, towards the end of chapter 13, he the promise is repeated that he will have a posterity, that he will have uh, land and people, basically. In Arabic, to this day, we're reminded of the Abrahamic covenant. Every time an Arab greets you, he will say, Ahlan wa Sahlan. Uh, those two words, Ahl wa Sahl, Ahl means people, and Sahl means plains or land. So land and people, Ahlan wa Sahlan. So that's basically the, the Abrahamic covenant. Not many people think of it that way, and it definitely was pointed out to me by a, by a member of the church decades ago, and it made sense. It made sense. So Abram is given the promise. Now in chapter 14, that's when, after, right after Lot separated himself from Abram, he separated himself from the blessed person, the elevated father. And there is this war that happens, the battles between kings. And Lot, you know, of course, because he's in a very wealthy area, a very wealthy neighborhood, let's say, very fertile, he probably has a lot of cattle. Of course, he becomes a target. And he, they come in and he... Uh, is taken uh, is taken a prisoner by one of these kings. So, in verse thirteen, chapter 14, uh, for, uh, 14 uh, a message comes to Abram the the Hebrew or uh, Haber, which basically indicates his status as a nomad. Haber or Abra it means the people who cross, people who are always traveling and crossing. So it comes to him that this is happening. So he takes 318 of his, of his household and he goes out and he liberates Lot. Now Lot in this whole affair, he, he's lost everything. And now Abram rest, restores it to him. So it's through association. It's, it's sort of as if the biblical writers want to tell us that when you separate yourself from Abram, from this person who has this covenant, who has this agreement with the Lord, when you're separated from that, you are uh, separated from blessings and, and you sort of have to deal with the world on your own. So Abram liberates him, brings him back, restores his, restores his stuff. And then we have someone now showing up in the story, the prince or the king of Shalem, the king of the city of peace, which will later be known as Jerusalem or Orshalim. And or remember, it's... Uh, uh, it means the, the city of peace. It means the city of peace. And we have this prince, Melchizedek. And Abram basically pays him a tithe. And I think one of the purposes of this story is not only to learn about giving tithes and to priesthood holders, but it's also to indicate early on in the biblical, in the text of the Torah, to indicate early on the status that Jerusalem, that Jerusalem, will play, 
that it, its status as a holy city. It's it's that relationship with Abraham. It's that relationship later on with the story of Isaac. So that is th that is this first uh, parts twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. That's these are the thoughts, the insights, and I have on them. Later on, we'll talk about 15, 16, and 17, more interesting stuff, more insights. Uh, thank you for listening.